Yes, folks, it's Tales uh, from the Jails with John G. Sutton. Do please like and subscribe. And also there's a link there to my interviews with uh, Sean Atwood and uh, James English down there, yeah? Links. And to my book, of course. Now, I'm going to talk today about that wonderful lady, that uh, empathetic, virtuous home secretary, Suella Braverman. Or Braverman, or whatever wants to call her bloody self, the silly bitch. Listen, she made a statement in Parliament saying that uh, homelessness in London was a lifestyle choice. People decide that they're going to live rough on the streets. If you go on to rightmove.com and pull up London and try and find the cheapest one-bedroom flat that you can find, you'll see that they they range from something like £1,500 a month to like three and a half, maybe £4,000 a month if you're getting around Kensington, Chelsea and that area. How is it a lifestyle choice if the, the amount of money it costs to rent a single room in London is like ten times above uh, the your, your, your income. <laughs> it's not a choice, is it? It just happens to be that people are not in uh, Silver Spoon territory here, like Braverman and Rishi Sunak. I mean, don't forget we're talking about people here who are extremely rich, but... Uh, Braverman is married to uh, an extremely uh, wealthy gentleman and uh, Rishi Sunak is himself a billionaire and his father-in-law is a multi-billionaire. And his father-in-law, by the way, advocates all working people should do 70 hours a week. That's Rishi Sunak's father-in-law who probably does work something like that himself, because he's uh, amassing a vast fortune. Quite what he's doing it for. I mean, my experience of having money is it's great to have enough. Sufficient is good. Having too much is a problem. Seriously. You have a load of money. You, you're getting begging letters. You're getting people come round. They want to borrow money off you. Terrible. I mean, you don't want that. And then people think you're rich. They really do. It's happened to me, actually. I had a series of books, five books published in one year in America. And uh, they were all over the world, my books. And people thought I was rich. I wasn't rich. I was getting 7.5% of, of the uh, printed uh, cost of the book, which, in actual fact wasn't a great deal when you think that uh, what had happened was my publishers had sold the rights to uh, book clubs like Scholastic in the USA. So although they printed like 50 to 100,000 copies, hmm, what, what happened was they paid a, a set fee. I got £600 for that. <laughs> £600. People said I was rich. Yeah, rich. Yeah. Bloody hell. I tell you, it's difficulty having money or people thinking you have money. But anyway, we're talking today about homelessness in London. And where do they end up? They end up in places like Wormwood Scrubs. And they come off the streets. They're, in, they're infested with the lice. The, they've got creepy crawly things inside the hair because they haven't washed for, I don't know, I saw one guy who, who obviously hadn't washed his hair for maybe 10 years because it was set on his head like a crash helmet. <laughs> Seriously. We had to shave the, the whole thing off. And then his head was all covered in sores and, ah, oh, terrible. And then you washed them down. I mean, it was cruel at the scrubs at the time. I mean, what, what they were doing, uh, they get the paraffin lamps, the tramps, in off the streets, usually on a Friday. So on a Saturday morning, they'd be thrown into the into the cells. They had certain cells on C1 landing, 
that were allocated to the paraffin lamps, uh, tramps, and uh, they'd, they'd take them first thing in the morning, put them in the shower unit, and they got a hose, a fire hose, and they hosed them down. Because these fire hoses are pretty powerful, you know. Whew. When you, it's, a, it's a strange sight watching naked human beings getting blasted across the shower unit with the fire hose. That's what the staff used to do. There's no good complaining to the governor or the chief officer or the principal officer. No good at all. You did that to say, just get about your duty. And that's all they said to me. I said, you can't treat people like this. The human beings, get about your duty, you know. So, and uh, I noticed people are saying, oh, well, uh, you, 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 you're a grass, you know, you, you're difficult, you would be difficult to work with. The thing is, I'm not a natural Nazi, you know. I'm not a natural member of the Gestapo. You know, I wouldn't make a, a, a very good... Uh, guard at Auschwitz or anywhere like that, I definitely would speak up against that. But some people who were making comments about me being a grass and all that, I ain't, I ain't entitled to make their opinions, but would they stand back and, and, and allow this to happen? They very likely would, because a lot of the staff did. And if you spoke out against it, as I did, then what happens... Yeah, they turn on you, you see. Mm. And unfortunately, the staff didn't realise that they were being dehumanised themselves. Because once you've taken a step down that route, where do you stop? At what point do you call halt? Yeah, because uh, inmates uh, are then treated like an alien race. You know, that's why they call them, uh, 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 strange ways and that, they call them cons. You know, oh, that's a bloody con, you know. Convict, yeah. They're human beings. These people, it could be your brother, your uncle, your grandfather, your dad, it could be you. There but for fortune. Go you or I. Believe me. And if you don't treat people with a bit of respect on the way, then they lose that, so that when they leave prison, these unfortunates are straight back with hate in their heart, hate for the system. That's not benefiting society. That's the problem with the prisons. They are not fit for purpose. They might have been all right 150 years ago, when criminals were, generally speaking, uh, standard robbers and but nowadays we've got drugs we've got all sorts of problems in society and we're treating them the same way that we would have treated a bandit yeah 150 years ago anyway Suella Braverman says it's a lifestyle choice somebody wants to have a word with that lady she's obviously not thinking straight or give her a week on the streets of London, say, Let's just see that for a lifestyle choice, love, yeah? She should also probably read uh, George Orwell's book, Down and Out in Paris and London. Seriously. It's, it's a very good book, that. It, 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 George Orwell went, uh, he became a tramp just for a couple of months, I believe. As it is something you might not know, do you know, have you heard of the term toe rag? Yeah, do you know what a toe rag is? Yeah, well, it's, it's a derogatory term these days used to uh, insult people who are scruffy down and out. But a toe rag, toe rags are actually rags that were tied between the toes of tramps because they were walking around and their feet and would would become the toes would become damaged rubbing against each other so they tied these rags between the toes to actually stop the toes from becoming uh, damaged hence the term toe rag there you go and now i'm going to read you a poem and uh, i'll just sound the alarm bell panic there panic in rotherham Grab your goat and go for it. Mm. I'm not, by the way, I am not a Scotsman. 
Yeah, I do not wear a kilt. I haven't got a kilt. Yep. And if I did wear a kilt, well, I wouldn't wear I don't wear a kilt, you know. So thank you very much for suggesting that, but I'm not. Anyway, yeah, I'm now going to read you a poem, seeing as uh, tomorrow is Remembrance Sunday. And uh, this is a poem by Wilfred Owen, who was a soldier in World War One. He was a lieutenant in World War One, and he was killed during World War One. But before he he was a poet, you see, and this is probably his most famous poem. It's Dulce et Decorum Est, which means it is right and good to die for your country. It isn't. Let me uh, read you this poem now. See, it's a bit lively, this light, isn't it? Yeah, here we are. Sitting comfortably. This is for Remembrance Sunday. Dulce et Decorum Est by Wilfred Owen. Bent double like old beggars under sacks. Knock need, coughing like hags. We cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, deaf even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Yes, yes, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, flirting the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone still was yelling out and mumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea I saw him drowning. In all my dreams before my helpless sight he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pass behind the wagons that we flung him in and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's mask of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high the children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dulciet decorum est pro patria more. It is right and good to die for your country. It isn't. It's a disgrace. Anyway, that's Tales from the Jails today. Do have a look. Like and subscribe, please. It's down there. This is John G. Sutton, Tales from the Jails. Remembrance Sunday tomorrow.